Let's ultrasound. On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasound, we're talking salivary glands and the normal ultrasound appearance. The normal ultrasound appearance of the three major salivary glands is going to be a hyperechoic echo texture ranging from a light gray color to white, and this is going to be dependent on the amount of fat in the glands. The fattier the gland, there's going to be more attenuation of the sound waves, meaning it's going to be harder to penetrate to deeper portions of the gland. This is very similar to what happens in a fatty liver on ultrasounds. So it may require decreasing the frequency in order to penetrate deeper into the glands. You may or may not visualize small pieces of the duct in the glands. Usually these can only be seen with a high frequency transducer, 10 megahertz or higher, and these small ducts can also be easily obscured by a fatty gland signal. You also may or may not visualize arteries and veins within the gland, which can also be obscured by a gland that has a fatty signal. The parotid gland in a transverse view, most of the time you can view both the superficial and the deep lobes, and this tends to be T-shaped or L-shaped. In the sagittal plane, the parotid gland, most of the time you only see the superficial lobe, which is going to appear oval and long. It can be more challenging to see the deep lobe in this view. Also, it's very common to visualize lymph nodes within the parotid gland parenchyma. And these are going to appear oval to round in shape with an outer hypoechoic thin cortex and an inner central hyperechoic fatty hilum. The submandibular gland in the transverse view is oval in shape and in the sagittal plane tends to be slightly triangular shaped. The sublingual glands are small on ultrasounds and in the transverse plane, they will be an oval shape that's turned on its side making it taller than wide. And in the sagittal plane, they'll appear oval and small and wider than tall. Now let's discuss the appearance of the different salivary glands on ultrasounds. The image to the left represents the typical appearance of a sagittal parotid gland on ultrasounds. The superficial portion of the gland can be visualized anterior to the retromandibular vein, and the deep portion of the gland is posterior to the retromandibular vein. In the sagittal plane, when the gland is fatty, it can be challenging to visualize the deeper portion of the sagittal parotid gland, as well as the ECA. Note that it's typical to visualize lymph nodes within the parotid, which will have thin outer hypoechoic cortex and inner central hyperechoic fatty hilum. The diagram to the right represents a transverse view of the parotid glands. The parotid gland will be shaped like a T or an L, sandwiched between the mandible and the mastoid process. The retromandibular vein will be the dividing line between the superficial and the deep portions of the gland, with the ECA located posterior to the retromandibular vein. Stenson's duct may or may not be visualized if it's normal, running anterior to the masseter muscle, which is going to be located anterior to the mandible on the ultrasound image. Now let's look at the typical appearance of the submandibular gland on ultrasounds. The drawing on the left represents a transverse submandibular gland. You'll note that it's slightly lobulated, hypervascular, and you commonly can see little pieces of blood vessels within the middle of the gland. The mylohyloid muscle is going to be inferior to the gland with the hyperechoic tongue below that. The image to the right is an oblique representation of the submandibular gland. And this is the plane that you want to get in order to try to visualize the Wharton's duct, which would be located below the mylohyloid muscle and anterior to the tongue on ultrasounds. It's exceedingly challenging to visualize Wharton's duct unless it is dilated and abnormal 
normal. So do not get discouraged if you cannot find this unless pathology is present within the duct. The intraparenchymal submandibular duct would run through the middle when it is visualized. Now let's look at the sublingual glands on ultrasounds. On the image to the left, if the transducer is placed in a transverse plane below the chin bone and then angled up, towards the tongue, you can visualize the hyperechoic tongue in the bottom portion of the image, and the genioglossus and the geniohyoid muscles anterior to the tongue. There's going to be a dark circular stripe on the ultrasound image. This is the mylohyloid muscle, and below this muscle, sandwiched between the mylohyloid muscle and the geniohyoid and the genioglossus muscles are going to be the right and left sublingual glands on ultrasound. And these are going to appear oval in shape in a taller than wide orientation in the transverse plane. They should be slightly hyperechoic in color, although it's not uncommon to see them slightly hypoic in color depending on machine settings. If you're struggling trying to visualize them using the auto optimize feature on the machine or the dynamic range setting will increase the contrast, which can help visualization of these tiny glands on ultrasound. However, it will make them appear more hypoechoic in color simply due to the contrast level. Anterior to the mylohyloid muscles are going to be the anterior body of the digastric muscles. On the image to the right, you'll note that the Wharton's duct travels anteriorly over the top of the right sublingual gland in the transverse plane. And this is why stones that are within that Wharton's duct, which is actually the submandibular duct can commonly be mistaken for stones within the right sublingual gland. Note the placement of the ducts of the rivenous. These are the ducts connecting the right sublingual gland to the tongue that export the saliva from the right sublingual gland. This would be a true location of a sublingual stone, which are rare. More commonly, you'll see a stone within Wharton's duct, which is a submandibular stone mimicking the appearance of a sublingual stone.